Paul Dixon here. Today I want to cover a piece of gear that I really haven't talked about a lot and that is trekking poles. Before I started the Appalachian Trail, I was looking at gear lists of other people who had through hiked either the AT or the PCT and I noticed that a lot of them used trekking poles and I wasn't really sure if it was something I needed. I had never been on an overnight backpacking trip but during my day hikes I hadn't used trekking poles and really hadn't seen a whole lot of people using them. Well in doing some research I found out that according to the ATC 90% of through hikers use trekking poles while only about 10 to 15% of day hikers use trekking poles. So it makes sense because, you know, I had never used them as a day hiker. And also when you are carrying a day pack with just some things that you might need for the day versus a pack that you're fitting three to seven days worth of supplies in, it's gonna be a little bit different weight-wise. So I read somewhere that some of the trekking pole manufacturers stated that up to 25% of the load that goes into your legs and hips from your pack could be reduced or redistributed into your arms through use of trekking poles. So that sounded great, but I was curious, you know, have there been any real studies on that? So it turns out there have been some limited studies. I'm gonna link to an article that gives you like a summary of the study uh, in the video description. Um, and if you wanna see the actual study, you can go to the bottom of that article and they cite it there. But anyway, in the article, it discusses how they got a group of men and women to go out and hack, you know, ascending and descending mountains for a 72 hour period. And I think it was every 24 hours they monitored fatigue, muscle soreness, and muscle damage. So apparently the results pretty strongly lean towards the fact that trekking poles can help with those different factors. They said in the article that the results present strong evidence that poles reduce muscle damage during a day's trek. Combined benefits of using trekking poles and reducing load to the lower limbs, increasing stability, and reducing muscle damage could also help avoid injury. Now, I couldn't read the exact study for myself because I had to like sign up for an account to actually access it, but I have linked to this article in the video description, and if you go to the bottom of that, you can see where the link is to access the full study if you're interested in learning about that and you know, you want to see what the sample size was and exactly what they did. Um, you know, and you can critique it. So whether you think that study is actually worthy of acknowledgement or not, uh, I can say that from my personal experience and being around other hackers that are doing either extended section hikes or through hikes, people who swapped from not using trekking poles to using trekking poles said that they noticed a big difference. And folks have said, especially going downhill, that they notice a difference that trekking poles have saved their knees and their joints from aching so much. Because if you think about it, when you're going down a hill and you're just your feet are constantly hitting the ground, uh, having those trekking poles to kind of lean on and help lower yourself. It's not something that you really think about after a while, it just kind of happens, but uh, it's definitely gonna help protect your joints from just being jammed. So in addition to potentially preventing you from injuring yourself, because I don't know how many times my trekking poles have saved me, they become like an extended arm and I've tripped and you know caught myself with my pole. I found them useful in other ways. So like when I go to the bathroom and I'm looking for snakes, you know, in the bushes or in the leaves, kind of tapping with my trekking pole to see if I hear something rattle or slither away before I actually step on it with my foot. And in the desert, on the opposite side of a rock, if I'm hiking, I'll kind of tap on the rock just to make sure, you know, nothing's hiding on the other side. Same thing with a log. Um, so just like a snake checker. Also with river crossings, uh, especially in the Sierra Nevada on the PCT, those were huge for me. I, I can't even imagine crossing rivers without trekking poles. When you're hiking down the trail and you've got brush or bushes that are hanging over the trail and you don't wanna rub your arm all up on it to get ticks on you, you know, you can kind of push it aside with your trekking pole. To clean out spider webs while you're hiking in the morning, sometimes you just wanna like scope something out that you can't tell what it is, like unidentified objects. You can check to see how deep mud is or maybe a puddle. Some people use them like me for my z -Packs duplex to set up their shelter so it kind of offsets the weight of a shelter having its own separate poles. And finally, you never know, it could be a good idea to have something like that for self-defense if you find yourself in that situation. So at this point, some of y'all are like, no, I don't need them, you know. But some of you are like, all right, you've got me listening, you know, how do I know now what type of trekking pole I should get? So there are several different features that'll set trekking poles apart from one another. And 
The first thing is the handle. So the handle on this trekking pole is cork. Now you can also have foam or rubber. I prefer the cork because to me they're the best at absorbing sweat. And that might sound a little gross, but while you're hiking, your hands are probably going to get hot and sweaty. The foam handles will absorb some sweat and they are softer, but they just don't seem to absorb as much. And finally, the rubber grips are not going to absorb really any sweat uh, and it can chafe your hand or create blisters just from rubbing so much. And I think they're more commonly used in colder climates, you know, when you're going to be hiking with gloves. Uh, to help kind of insulate your hand. The next thing that's going to set trekking poles apart is what the shaft is made of. So this one is carbon fiber, but you could also have aluminum. The pair that I hiked with on the AT were aluminum, and I'll link to both of the different types of trekking poles that I've used in the video description also if you want to just learn more about them. So carbon fiber is going to be lighter than aluminum. It's going to be a little bit less durable though, so this is more likely to snap in half like if I'm sliding down somewhere and it gets wedged in a root and you know has a lot of pressure on it it could snap it whereas the aluminum might bend rather than snap the aluminum trekking poles are also probably going to be more economical so they're cheaper than your carbon fiber trekking poles the next thing to look at is the adjustability of a trekking pole so some will be fixed so they're just a certain length and you can't really you know adjust it or like break it down personally i don't care for the fixed trekking poles because they just seem to be more of a pain when you get to town uh, or if say you're boulder hopping and you want to collapse your trekking poles and get them out of the way so they're not you know tripping you up or catching if you've got them hanging on your pack somehow or so that you can use both hands you're not you know holding on to trekking poles with one of your hands and then if you're going to be using your trekking poles for say your tent or your shelter uh, you want to make sure you have some that are adjustable because you know it's going to make a difference in the height of your shelter. They also have foldable options, so ones that um, kind of pull apart and then fold up when you want to collapse them. And then they have some that are shock absorbent. I don't really like the idea of trekking poles giving while I'm leaning on them, but apparently, you know, it kind of helps with the shock of especially going downhill. And from what I've read, most of those have the option of like turning that feature off, but that just seems like to me something else that could malfunction. I don't know if you've had any experience with the shock absorbent ones, I would love to hear your take on it. I just haven't used them. For me personally, I just really like these regular old, you know, adjustable um, slide into itself trekking pole. All right, so next up is the locking mechanism. So for locking mechanisms, you have a lever, like external lever like this, or you might have the ones that twist lock, so they twist to unlock, adjust it, and then twist it back the other way to lock it. And then the push button, so where you have like a button that you push in and extend it where you want it and it pops out and locks in place. And then some of them have a combo where on the top section it might have one type and on the bottom section another type. Me personally, obviously, I like the external lever. I just feel like it really clamps down well. Um, I've seen people have problems with the twist ones. I'm not saying that if you get that kind you're definitely going to have issues, uh, but I would definitely read some reviews and kind of see what folks are saying about the particular trekking pole that you're looking into buying. Because the last thing you want is a locking mechanism that when you're, you know, leaning down and, and you're like going downhill especially and you're leaning forward, you don't want this thing to fail on you and give and then you find yourself, you know, tumbling down the hill. The next thing you might notice on different trekking poles is a little plastic round piece towards the bottom and that is called a basket. So you can get larger baskets if you're going to be hiking in snow or, you know, really muddy terrains. Uh, the basket has not really been something that I worry about. Even hiking in the snow in the Sierra Nevada, I didn't worry about getting a big basket and I got along just fine. Next is the tip on the trekking poles. So um, most of these are made of like carbide or steel tip on the end. And um, I thought when I first got my first pair of trekking poles that once this wore down, the trekking pole was just like done, uh, but they can actually change this whole piece out here. So um, if you have some that have worn down, don't throw them away, you can just replace them. They have rubber tip protectors that you can slide over this. 
Uh, if you're going to collapse your trekking poles and, you know, strap them to the top and you don't want to have to worry about turning and jabbing somebody's eye out, or if you're going to stick it in a pocket of your pack and you want to make sure it doesn't poke through the material. Some people have environmental concerns about the tips on the pole. So because you've got so many people that use trekking poles now and it stabs into the ground or scratches up the rock out on the trail, you know, some people have um, seemed a little concerned that that's violating leave no trace or could uh, increase erosion issues. So the ATC has said that, you know, if people are concerned about that, even though there haven't been like any actual studies of the effects of using trekking poles on the trail. If that's something you're concerned about, you can get rubber tips to cover up that metal tip and uh, just kind of, you know, help protect some of that. Next up, we've got the straps. So I don't use these, um, I know, gasp. A lot of people think that if you don't use the straps, then you're not using the trekking pole properly and it's just worthless. Um, actually, for that, uh, if y'all feel that way, I've got an article by Andrew Skirka, who is um, a pretty awesome dude and has been on some pretty cool adventures. So if y'all aren't familiar with him, you should check that out. Uh, but it's his take on why he cuts the straps off of his trekking poles. Anyway, on the AT and the PCT, I didn't use them. You know, I just kind of hold the poles uh, and keep the strap loose. But if you're going to use the straps on your trekking poles, which I think most people do, I just want to make sure that you're doing it right. So when you are looking at the trekking pole, you want to put your hand up through like the bottom of the strap and then wrap your hand around it. Some people think that you're supposed to go directly through it like this. But the reason you go up through the bottom is because if you fall down, you don't want the pressure of the strap being on top of your thumb because it can dislocate it or potentially break it, you know, depending on how you fall. So it's just safer uh, to go up through the bottom. So how do you know how long your trekking poles should be? Well, it's gonna depend on how tall you are. So basically when the tip of the trekking pole is touching the ground and you've got your arms by your side and your hands out, you wanna make sure that your elbow has a 90 degree angle. Also a couple other tips, when you're going uphill, uh, the experts of the trekking pole world say that you should shorten your trekking pole length and you wanna kind of hack with the trekking pole pointed back and it's gonna be the opposite when you go downhill. So you wanna have your trekking poles a little bit longer and you're gonna have them slightly pointed forward as you're descending. Now to be completely honest, I don't generally adjust mine while I'm going up and downhill, but if you're gonna use them properly and get the most out of them as far as taking a load off of you, that is the way to do it. So if you're just starting out and you've never used them before, trekking poles might feel a little awkward to use. The first day of my AT through hike, I had to ask somebody like, hey, how exactly do you use trekking poles and you know, when do I know when I'm supposed to use them? And they're like, well, you can pretty much use them all the time. And this person suggested that I start off using one first, kind of like a cane, and get used to that and then incorporate the other. And that's exactly what I did. I, I used just one pretty much the whole first day. And then after that, I was like, all right, I've got this, you know. And eventually it does. It becomes like just an extension of your body and it feels like, you know, you're a dog or a cat and you're just walking with four legs. All right, y'all, well, that's what I have for you today on the topic of trekking poles. And I'm not saying that they are a necessity for a successful section or through hike. I'm just saying that I do see a lot of benefit from using them. And if you're having any issues with your knees or joints, you know, it might be something good for you to look into trying. I'd love to hear what specific features y'all appreciate in trekking poles and why. So maybe some of the folks that are currently in the market for trekking poles can kind of see what works for other people. And again, I'll have the ones that I have used in the video description. And if you found this or any other video helpful on this channel, and you would like to support the work I do here, you can do so at no additional cost to you by just shopping through my Amazon affiliate link. So to do so, you just go to DixieAZ.com and then follow the link to Amazon there and do your shopping as normal. Thank y'all so much for watching and we will see y'all next time.